Shri, the Seraph, the Jeddah Shri, uh, to one and all. Uh, the festive season is treating is going smoothly and going well for everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here today uh, at the, at the launch of this uh, of this program, which is really coming in between a, a fairly you know in depth collaboration and research, and you know now it's converting into a program which uh, actual implementation on the ground is really going to start um, and is going to happen over the next three years uh, with a lot of the partners. I would especially like to welcome um, AP Mass AFC. Um, as well as well Tangar, uh, partners of the program, uh, which are extremely crucial to actually get this going. Um, we also have with us a lot of other key stakeholders, including Harsha Trust, Hydro Greens, who will be speaking throughout the session. So thank you so much for being here, uh, you know, on a festival day, but also really kind of bringing to the criticality of, of what needs to be done for potato and tomato uh, farmers, especially small and marginal farmers in India. Uh, this program specifically has been the core partner for this program is GIZ GIC. I will briefly introduce it uh, during the context setting, uh, but to basically talk about a little bit of the flow of the program today, uh, we will start with a small context setting on what has been done till date. Um, you know, after that we'll go into three particular case stories. Uh, you know, one uh, which is really at a farm level, uh, a sprayers case stories from Odisha at a farm level. Uh, uh, with SAGs, which um, uh, Gotham, Mr. Uh, Mr. Gotham will be, um, you know, presenting. After that, we'll briefly go into a case study on hydroponics at a farm level uh, as well, uh, at a nursery level as well. Then we'll basically hear from directly from an entrepreneur who has done uh, a lot of value add uh, with the potato on the last sort of end uh, value chain on the processing and retail side of potato, uh, specifically with chips making, uh, how she has been able to sort of improve her income. So we'll hear from one of the um, rural entrepreneurs uh, on chips making as well. Post that, uh, we have a very special uh, opening speaker with us from GIZ GIC, and I'll briefly introduce that for about 10 minutes. Uh, post that, uh, we will dive into the session, which is an active, uh, candid panel discussion between uh, AFC, AP Mass, Weltanga, Selco, which will be moderated with uh, by Mr. Shashi uh, as well. So that's just the flow of the session for today. I'm just going to share my screen for the uh, context setting very briefly before we jump into the session today. Yeah, um, Prashant, you can see my screen, right? Correct. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so this is basically, as I said, you know, it's the we did a brief, I would say, a research uh, with uh, GIZ GIC program and with the partners on the ground, uh, AP Mass and AFC primarily. And what we basically looked into was across the tomato and potato value chain, what is the role of sustainable energy? What is the role of energy efficiency? And specifically both of these aspects, how can they really lead to augmenting better value add for the farmers, better value add for the value chain entrepreneurs more towards the last mile? And none of this, as we all know, you know, none of this comes in isolation, right? It's, it's all a combination of whether there is good market linkage, whether there is good financial models, uh, you know, whether you have good training, capacity building and mentoring at various levels. And of course, whether there's an enabling conditions for a lot of these to be uh, taken up and adopted and scaled uh, within the local um, within the local context where these actually belong. Right? So all of these aspects are what were looked into uh, with the partnerships. Uh, to go in very briefly into the tomato and the potato value chain and what came out of this research, um, you know, I think most of the people on this call are, uh, you know, either people that have been working with FPOs that have been supporting FPOs along these challenges, as well as entrepreneurs and technology providers that are actually working on how do you overcome some of these challenges uh, within the value chain. And I think the goal is not just to, you know, power different nodal points of the value chain, but it's really to see what can be disrupted within the value chain to transform the way in which uh, the practice happens, right? So say, for example, if processing happens really at a, at a much more, you know, down the value chain, can we actually bring it closer to the farmer level so that there's better storage, there's better value addition, better diversification. So it's really the goal is one is 
to look at where sustainable energy can really lead to improvement of income, savings, drudgery reduction uh, more than anything. But also the second part is how can we really look at existing activities, but add on to the activities within the nodal points to see where that value can be uh, better improved, right? So these are just some of the examples and challenges which I won't go through in detail because you know most of the stakeholders are, are they 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 know these problems very well. But in terms of what came out of that early stage research uh, with the partners uh, was these kinds of solutions um, that can really, if provided with the right kind of um, you know context and if provided with the right kind of finance, uh, they can actually lead to much better incomes at the farm level. So some of them are also, have also been highlighted here, which we will be uh, working with both APMAS and AFC uh, to actually implement on the ground. Uh, so at a nursery level, you see hydroponics, you see solar water pumps. At a farm level, whether it's de-weeders, whether it's um, cold storage units, as well as sprayers, you'll hear more about this today, um, which actually leads to better drudgery and income at a farm level. At a processing level, looking at grading and sorting, uh, looking at packaging, looking at really kind of value add or uh, more towards at an FPO level, how can we sort of facilitate those? And I think all of these are um, high risk to, to some extent or the other, right? There's no existing kind of uh, silver bullet which we implement and will immediately lead to better outcomes. But that being said, I think the there is during COVID, uh, you know, we see two silver linings per se, uh, you know, one being a lot of the stakeholders realizing the value add of decentralization, right? For feed and fodder, for cold storage, for processing. One, I mean, we, we keep talking about resilience building. One aspect is really that criticality that we need to move towards decentralized systems in general. And the second thing, and I think this particular webinar is a strong example of that, is we see unprecedented collaboration happening between different stakeholders. So both of those being silver linings, similarly within the potato value chain, uh, you know, at a pre-farm level, the the to actually have um, production of local seed potato, uh, which is more sustainable, more accessible, transportation of these to really look at providing appropriate uh, kind of water solutions, water energy, food nexus solutions, appropriate technological implementation at the farm level for potato farmers. At a processing level, you know, although India has unprecedented amount of cold storage units for potatoes specifically, uh, you know, but it's extremely skewed. I mean, lot. I think we also did a session uh, sometime back which was focused around cold storage and cold storage units. And I think uh, one of my colleagues will just quickly put a link to that session because that session talks, it's a three-part web series which talks only about cold storage units, the technology, the financial models, the ownership models, uh, but it really kind of highlights the gap uh, in terms of where these cold storages are and for what kinds of uh, stakeholders they've actually been done and the need to further decentralize these as well. So if anyone's interested specifically in the cold storage, uh, there is a lot more discussion on this link which we can share um, so everyone can just have access. Um, and within the potato value chain, similar to how you saw in the tomato value chain, you know, these are the main kind of highlighted uh, solutions that came out, out of which the, the ones that are in bold are solutions that we will start working uh, with APMAS and AFC to really build out value propositions. Uh, you do the necessary innovation that is needed and then come up with templates and models that can really be scaled across the small and marginal farmers and the farm groups. Um, of course, some of these, as you see, would be already tried and trusted, tested and, you know, which, which we have ready models for scale. But some of these really need to be demonstrated. They really need to be innovated upon. You do need to uh, modify them or repurpose kind of reinvent or, and highlight the gap that exists for these solutions to be taken up uh, and to actually impact last mile um, uh, communities, right? So similar to that, uh, we will be sort of initiating um, solutions which are in different phases. Uh, one is things that we need to test out, which we need to really demonstrate, which we need to validate. The second is where we can actually pilot these 
strategy solutions with more number of uh, uh, SAG groups or FPOs or individual farm entrepreneurs. Uh, the third is solutions which work well, which have proven themselves like small water pumps and hydroponics, which are actually, you know, not, not just, they don't really need much uh, technology innovation. So the third aspect will be really to look at how do you best scale it up? How do you look at, you know, maybe FPOs and, and cooperatives getting um, financing for this and then furthering the finance for their members. So those kind of more scalable models. And the fourth is where, you know, you really need, we are kind of identifying the gaps, whether it's in infrastructure or technology or financial model, but really kind of ensuring that there is a enabling system for, for local uh, families and farmers to actually understand these solutions, get access to it, be a part of developing it as partners rather than end users and, and you know, things like that. So with that, uh, you know, we'll get started with our first uh, demonstration of the session. Um, I would like to introduce um, Mr. Gautam Pradhan, a long-term friend and a partner uh, to Selco and of the SDG7 or the energy sector rather, who's been responsible for a lot of the innovations uh, when it comes to really validating, proving out uh, the role of energy within the agricultural value chain. So he will be introducing, and they've implemented an SHG rental model for uh, solar powered sprayers. So I request him to please introduce it. And then there's a small video that we would show. Okay, thank you. Welcome, uh, Mr. Gautam. Yeah, you can start. Yeah, thank you, Uda Hudaji, and uh, good morning to all, one and all. Uh, uh, it's a great privilege for me to uh, be in part of this type of uh, activities. And uh, Harsa Trust, uh, being a partner to Selco Foundation, we have been inter uh, implementing this type of products uh, since last few years. And uh, recently, uh, during COVID period, although we have uh, uh, introduced so many implements and equipment, agricultural implement for the livelihood enhancement of the poorest of the poor, but we found that uh, solar sprayer, uh, basically uh, the cost is very low, uh, so, uh, as much as uh, 7,000 rupees uh, for sprayer uh, with battery and uh, as well as solar panel. So it has been adopted widely uh, uh, by the farmers. And uh, looking at the uh, uh, context or the scenario, particularly in southern Odisha part, uh, where the women farmers are more interested to uh, be in the uh, farming sector and they are involved directly in the farming sector, we found that uh, due to less uh, drudgery in this type of solar sprayer, they are uh, renting those things within the uh, SSG model and SSG are taking the responsibility and ownership of the entire uh, uh, solar sprayer and they are uh, giving it to the farmers whenever it is required. And for hour, it is uh, they are charging near about 10 rupees uh, uh, per hour to the uh, uh, farmers or to the individual who has taken uh, those, uh, those sprayer in rental. Uh, and uh, as a result of what happened, actually people need not spend uh, 7,000 rupees from their pocket, but uh, they are using this type of equipment uh, for the long term uh, as a productive, I would say this is a purely productive and durable assets for the organization, uh, for the institutions like SSG and it is being widely accepted by the community. And I think uh, that ha that can be taken uh, in the further course of time for the replication it's a large scale and we are also doing this and now what is happening actually SSG who are not in terms of uh, being a part of solar uh, solar system they are also uh, uh, purchasing those type of things from the from using it in their farm. Just show a short video, and I know that uh, for all the participants, uh, Asha, uh, Mr. Gautam is going to be here. So, if you have any questions related to the income brackets that that these, this is being most impactful for the drudgery, the cost, uh, how it's running, please feel free to post your questions, and he would be able to directly answer it uh, as he has access to it. So, uh, please feel free to uh, thank you so much, uh, Gautam. Sir, if we can have the video. Padmagoda is a farmer in Sanamaji Guda village of Borikoma in Koraput, Odisha, having a productive land of 1.6 acres, cultivating different crops such as bittergourd, tomatoes, cauliflower, chili ladyfingers, cucumber, and paddy. During the Rabi and Kharif season, she would use a manual sprayer to spray pesticides on the crop. It would take her approximately six hours of hard work under the sun to complete one acre of land. The farmers need to do this at least two to three times in the farming season and might be more 
depending on the pest and disease occurrence. Some farmers also spray growth regulators using the sprayer. Three main challenges faced during manual spraying are the time taken for pesticides application in manual machines, coverage of the machine. Manual machines do not cover crops like bittercot, parwal, which grow to a taller height when grown in machan cultivation model. Drudgery. The manual machine gives high drudgery to a farmer. Harsha Trust, an organization working in the region to build capacity and mobilize small farmers for improved incomes and food security, partnered with Selco Foundation to innovate on a solution for the problems identified by hundreds of farmers like Padma. In accordance to the need, Selco Foundation compared and tested different mechanized pesticide sprayers. The self-help groups promoted and facilitated by the Harsha Trust were identified as partners for testing the solution and as service providers to the farmers in their region. A charging station was set up in the village of Sanamaji Guda under one self-help group for sharing of sprayers amongst farmers as and when needed. A solar design was done for a charging station with four numbers of battery-operated sprayers with 16 liters of capacity each to run on a field for four to five hours when fully charged. At the time of need, on a weekly basis, the farmers rent the sprayer for 20 rupees a day from the centralized charging station run by the self-help group. The farmers in the village have land sizes of approximately 1 to 1.5 acres. With one charge, the farmers are able to use the machine two times a day, two hours in the morning and two hours in the evening. The energy-efficient battery-operated solar powered sprayer is being used by over 20 farmers through the self-help group in Sanamajigura. It has not only reduced the drudgery, but has also reduced the spraying time by about 40%. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Prashant, for, for showing the video. Luckily, it was smooth. Otherwise, we always have issues with videos on this platform. So touch wood, it continues that way. Uh, but we'll go into our next case story for today. I request uh, Manju to please um, you know, start off with the next case story, which is basically on hydroponics unit at a nursery level. So Manju, over to you. I also want to announce that we also have uh, Mr. Vasant Kamath uh, from Hydro Greens, who is the entrepreneur who's really who's implemented about more than 100 of these systems in different contexts. So he is also here to give any kind of feedback and answer the questions you might have on hydroponics. So over to you, Manju. Thank you, Huda. Thank you for context setting. And uh, thank you, Gautam, sir, for uh, that case study. Um, uh, Prashant, you would like to share or can I share the screen? Prashant? Prashant? Yes, yes, I'm sharing it. Can you see it now? No, no, please stop sharing. I'll share the screen. Uh, sir, let me share it because there are certain videos which are embedded. It will play here. Yeah, let's go ahead. Go ahead, Manjir. Yeah, <clears throat> I, I, I think this uh, slide is uh, it's quite lengthy. Prashant, could you uh, like uh, make me as uh, like I can share the screen? Sure, sure, sure. You do it. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, please yeah, share. My screen is visible. Not yet. Can you reshare, please? Now? Sorry for the delay. No, no, not yet. Prashant, if you don't mind, please go back to the film. I think some problem. I'll I, share it. Sure, I'm, sure, I'm, no share, I'm, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sharing, sharing newer version with you. Is this fine? Is this presentation fine, Manju sir? Yeah, I think this is fine. I'm sorry. So ah, sorry, it, sorry, it? sorry, 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 everyone. Uh, good morning. Uh, so, so I mean, uh, we would like to share about some hydroponics. How, how hydroponics has an important nodal point on the uh, tomato value chain, which we would like to work because based on our research findings, so we 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 thought of like you know introduce I mean work work on hydroponics for especially for nursery farmers. 
So uh, next slide, please. And look at this. Actually, when we uh, started working on this, you know, started research on this tomato valley chain, that we found that a lot of water and uh, water uh, requirement for this tomato as well as this space it was also constrained for majority of the farmers, especially the farm farm producer organizations who are working uh, and 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 were engaging in raising the seedlings. Next slide, please. Yeah, this is hydroponics. Is kind of like you know vertical farming. It's uh, we we have seen a good impact uh, from from other uh, other uh, valley China as well. If example under dairy valley chain, which we have seen a lot of uh, positive response on this different fodder uh, vertical uh, uh, you know uh, growing uh, tray modeling and here this hydrophonics is one of the more efficient and art friendly solution than the conventional farmers when we look at this current the climate change and all uh, the lot of farmers are really facing uh, when it go to the different kinds of nursery farming so next slide please yeah these are the some of the pictures Next slide, please. Yeah, 95% of water we are using. Next, please, please. And uh, this this uh, hydrophonic especially very much suitable for the small farmers. So look at the current Indian statistics. More than our 86 farmers are the small and marginal farmers, and in the, they they are still facing a lot of problem. Uh, in 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 uh, growing the different uh, crop produce in the limited space of land, and we thought of it is less space needed and this more land remains in. Especially the way the farmers, the tomato goes. So look at the statistics also that uh, the marginal farmers, the way they are going half an acre or one acre of uh, tomato, they they can easily go for this kind of nursery rising, and then they they can use the less space needed, and then they can uh, still utilize the land which remains uh, 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 in their respective farm. Next slide, please. And these are the pictures which we have uh, uh, installed recently for this uh, tomato uh, nursery, where the tomato uh, 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 saplings rise farmers, especially farm producer organizations, so they can adapt this solution. And then go for this kind of nursery, vertical uh, nursery rising. Uh, next slide, please. And this is a small video which we would like to uh, uh, run through uh, how this hydro green solutions is really uh, working. And then they look at this how the uh, field teams are. I mean, the, they are a, a implementing, and this is a just an just a clip on like how they are going to install at the different farm level. And this is the one example which we have done uh, with uh, AP mass uh, in Madanpalli area where the farmers are rising the seedlings in the greenhouse area. Sorry, there is no voice pressure. I think we can skip no problem. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Yeah. Sorry for some technical error. Uh, yeah. I think, uh, I mean, uh, uh, as I was mentioning in the beginning, like, you know, we used to test it uh, in a different dairy value chain, and it's uh, especially for growing the feeds. And with, I mean, this is like without make, uh, adding any artificial pesticide and fertilizer. Here also, we would like to go with. Uh, uh, I, I know the vertical farming and especially the uh, uh, the, the tomato seedlings. So next next slide, please. Yeah, this is how we can uh, prepare our the trays which we are going in this vertical farming by using the cocoa pit. And then so especially uh, when we when we we thought of started working on this tomato uh, nursery, this uh, this lot of uh, because we are not using any soil and this coconut. It is as a, 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 a good mode, like you know, we can go for this uh, nursery rising. Next slide, please. And this is a schematic uh, diagram, but like uh, how the solar powered uh, solar, uh, uh, you know, hydrophonics will be installed at. Uh, look at the panels, like you know, 
this this is like you know complete uh, solar powered unit only where the smaller the 40 watt uh, the uh, uh, solar power motor then i mean we can easily help for this so uh, irrigating this vertical kind of uh, hydroponics and this solar system line diagram is especially which we have also uh, seen this 40 40 kg to 50 kg per day production capacity especially in in tomato uh, nursery where this uh, FPOs can go for this, like you know, can reduce the number of days, uh, 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 especially when raising this system, because we can uh, go for uh, early uh, transplanting uh, like that. So next slide, please. Yeah. So many times farmers are really facing a huge problem because, in especially because I, there are a lot of hydroponics are available in the market, but. While 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 use, using those, it's a, again the energy is the biggest challenge for us. So many times the farmers are really facing a quality of power supply when having that like you know that leads to a few results. And then also in India, production capacity and the energy requirement of hydrophotonic technology is too large. So that uh, with Salco Foundation started working on this particular uh, hydrophonics technology, and we in 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 coming in the down the line to two to three years, we would like to. Do the lot, uh, do the testing and the photo for pilot projects with uh, APMAS and and as well as in the AFC in Kadur area where they're widely growing the tomato crops. Next slide, please. Yeah, these are the pictures which we have from the field. Next slide, please. Yeah. So this, uh, I, as I was mentioning again, like you know. The tomato crop issues of water mm -hmm. availability is a very uh, challenging. And then we, what we thought as at a nursery level, let's let's uh, introduce the solar powered smaller water pump uh, along with the solar powered, uh, you know, hydrophonics. Uh, this really help us to pick uh, and with also distracting the farmers uh, of of, of, cow, uh, uh, of agricultural operations. We can go for this technology. Next slide, please. Yeah, so this is the common solar system can be designed input a pilot in the same nursery, which can also used for hydrophonics as well as like, you know, especially the irrigation and additionally, which we have, we are along with this hydrophonics, we are also, uh, uh, you know, testing and we are also like, you know, piloted in other areas. We are also doing the small water pumps for this saplings nursery. Yeah, these are the pictures which we have done from the Installation is done at OPMRC. Yeah, this is the pilot being discussed, uh, designed, and uh, this could potentially convert complete nursery hydrophonics and because. Uh, uh, when we have seen the, in the field, like you know, a lot of farmers, especially the one FPO, the one nursery, can also help the 50 or different potato cultivators. Where once hydroponics, the solar power hydroponics really gather their so you know, so their purpose and then uh, provide the 50 uh, farmers the seedlings and supplies to that particular area. So yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, these are the different pictures. Yeah, this production can also would influence the small farmers to grow tomato in a very sustainable way. And this is also a good, very livelihood uh, landscape for uh, them to go any entrepreneur by adopting this kind of technology and raise the nursery and raise the saplings at the field level and distribute it to the different local farmers. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much, uh, Manju, for that. Uh, I think we also have uh, Mr. Vasant Kamath, who is online. So I think for further details on this, please feel free to put in your questions and he can definitely answer it. And we'll also share his contact for anybody who has further questions on it. Uh, I request to go to the next and the final case study of today before introducing our opening speaker. Uh, the last case study of today is a chips making unit of a rural entrepreneur. Uh, Manju, if you could could give a quick uh, background and then we'll go into the video for this. Thank you. Sure, sure. Yeah, uh, the, this is again from potato to the tomato, tomato valley chain. Uh, so uh, and the food processing, we are also focusing more on the potato valley chain. And uh, 
uh, thanks to gic very recently we an, uh, had an opportunity to work on complete value chain analysis on the potato and and then since we already started under food processing this is the one potato chips making unit which we have done so the video which we are going to run now like you know this family is from the northern part of karnataka the uh, a village name called uh, in the in the manvi raichur uh, block and we uh, uh sorry uh, this uh, haravi family like you know because uh, amramma uh, she is she she, she uh, along with her uh, uh, husband they they are basically a bangle making farmer their primary source of income was bangle making so and then they thought of like you know they they because since they have like you know their family size number is seven members including the three girl childs they wanted to go for the diversification of their livelihood and then they with uh, they went through through our local partner when we approached them and then they are also seeking support from selco foundation we have been to introduce this solar powered chip, chips making unit for them as an alternative source of alternative uh, uh, you know livelihood solution so once uh, this they uh, diversified their so solar powered uh, uh, and uh, the, the once they diversified their livelihood uh, uh, option into the chips making unit uh, because they uh, you know Uh, are in a good amount of income because uh, during the covid uh, crisis so they are not able to see the lot of villages not able to go to the different uh, rural sandis their business was completely distracted and stopped and thanks to the solar power uh, chips making unit they really catered and really serve the community and they are now happily uh, living their life yeah go to the video रमेशर गीता मैडम मार्केट आलूरी दिवस इपत्जी आ अनुकूल हल्की कोट्टो जीवन नर्सा करती है। नमक नाक में जन्म मुकर रहे, और वो घर में गए तो मन की कुटुम्ब रहने दो। ये तो चिप्स मारा लेते ही क्या ना वो अनुपला के तेरे, अनुपला के इधर लेते अंडे पुड़े में आपर मारे, इधर लेते जीवन साक्षात अनुपला के तेरे। thank you thank you so much uh, for the videos and uh, for the cases uh, thank you to all the users time making to have them on the session today but it being a festival season it was a little difficult to do that so this is the next best thing that we could do but thank you to all the partners that have gotten this together uh, we're right on time to go into our opening speaker i would like to introduce and welcome mr garrett collitz uh, he heads the giz gic center which is basically the green innovation center for food and agriculture sector in india uh, he will be giving our opening and keynote before we dive into the session thank Thank you so much for being here, Mr. Garrett. Welcome. Now the technology is also working. Good morning. Um, a very early morning um, from Germany, um, uh, from Bonn, uh, GIZ headquarters. And yeah, good morning to everyone in the in the chat. Um, my name is Garrett, and uh, yeah, as you said, I'm responsible for the 
uh, Green Innovation Center, the GIZ project, and we are based in, in Bangalore. Um, I want to just say, um, after congratulating on these very interesting examples of renewable energy solutions in the agricultural sector, um, uh, I also want to say a few words about the background of the project. So we are GIZ, we are the, um, the German uh, company for uh, tec um, yeah, technical cooperation. We are working on behalf of the German Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. And GIZ has been in India for about 60 years now, working on a number of different topics in regards to technical cooperation, be it the environment, climate change, biodiversity, but also more and more topics of uh, sustainable urban and industrial development, uh, skilling and jobs, and also energy, which has been one of the main focus areas during the last few years. Now, our project, the Green Innovation Center for the Agriculture and Food Sector, is, uh, has been implemented since 2014 as part of a bigger global project of uh, now 16 countries which are addressing um, or which are looking into improving certain selected value chains. The idea is to increase the income of smallholder farmers, to improve um, the farming enterprises by introducing farming as a business. And we're doing this in India by focusing on three distinct value chains. Um, we, have, uh, we have heard about them, tomato and potato, and we have recently added um, the value chain of apple in one particular Indian and this is also, I think, very interesting. We're looking at creation of jobs, especially for uh, agripreneurs, um, with a focus on women and youth, uh, this, uh, as, as some of the drivers in the rural areas. And we want to provide training and, and uh, sort of this uh, opportunities for them to develop their businesses to make them uh, ready for the future. Um, of course, on the, on the very sort of uh, ground level, we are training more than 140,000 farmers in good agricultural practices where we're promoting certain innovations um, to improve productivity and at the same time um, uh, increase the income of the farmers. Now, um, since um, last year, we also have two new um, focus areas for the project. One is the management of natural resources, and the other one is um, the integration of renewable energy solutions and energy efficiency in the um, agricultural value chains, which we're supporting. Um, we are in four states um, currently. Just uh, I've mentioned it. We are in Himachal Pradesh, as you can um, guess for the apple value chain and then in the three southern Indian states of uh, Maharashtra, Karnataka and also Andhra Pradesh. But now why are we talking um, renewable energy solutions and agricultural value chains? Um, there is a bigger strategic process and orientation from our ministry in Germany um, uh, which has uh, selected India as a global partner to address challenges in regards to the global public goods, be it biodiversity, being water, or being climate. So climate change, uh, uh, adoption and mitigation of the effects of climate change is really on the uh, agenda for the German government. And uh, traditional ways of producing energy are, as we all know, a primary source of CO2. And um, therefore, I think there's a strong belief that there is alternative ways of producing energy and providing energy uh, in, in rural areas of the world. And um, these ways are sort of, they have been really meaningful pilots and now uh, can be upscaled for the future. Um, yeah, for that, um, we have, I'm, I'm really happy that we have this uh, sort of big sounding board today on board and, and, and welcome to Selco for as the organizers uh, for this. Um, I think with you, we have a partner to look into that with our project. 
to demonstrate some of these solutions uh, as part of our value chain development works and then um, develop also these um, uh, business models for, for the future scaling of the approaches. Um, yeah, um, don't want to take too much of your time. Looking forward to the to the uh, discussions uh, of uh, of this morning. Um, the, the examples which we've seen are already very interesting, and and yeah, looking forward to uh, to the cooperation with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Garrett, for that apt and and really kind of crisp opening note. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, with Thank that, you. we will dive into the main session uh, for today. Uh, I would like to welcome. I would request all the panelists to please switch on their videos. Um, Mr. Shashi Kumar will be anchoring the panel session for today. He will be moderating it. Uh, hi, hello, Shashi. Good morning. Welcome. Uh, and with us, we have on the panel uh, key members and core partners from Wealth Unger, AP Mass, uh, uh, AFC, and Selco as well. Uh, so, Shashi, over to you and over to the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Huda. Uh, Good afternoon to the participants uh, from India and uh, good morning to the participants from Europe. Uh, on this wonderful day, uh, we have assembled to discuss on the nexus between agriculture and energy. As from Gerrit, uh, we had achieved uh, some milestones into the Green Innovation Center uh, project. Uh, one of the enabling factor for uh, bringing that kind of achievement or achieving the milestone is our partners. Recognizing our partners, we do have uh, brought them as in panel members, as speaker. We have uh, Mr. Mans Lanting, uh, team leader from Agriculture and Finance Consultancy. We shortly name it as AFC. And uh, Mr. C.S. Reddy, CEO, CEO, Mahila Abhivarti Society, Andhra Pradesh. We shortly name it as AP Mass. Uh, Mr. Partha Sarbi, team leader with Thungelfe, and last but not the least, Rachita Mishra, Associate Director, Selco Foundation. Uh, one quick remark to the participants please text your questions and possibly indicate the speaker's name to respond to your questions. Moving on to our panel, uh, each of our panel speakers would get uh, two minutes initially to brief about their organization. Uh, first, would request uh, Mans Lanty from AFC. Welcome, Mans. Thank you. Uh, you want two minutes of my comments. <laughs> I will try to uh, do that. It's not uh, so simple. Um, let me first, let's say, look at the scale we are working. So the scale we are working is uh, with about, I would say, 20,000 potato farmers and roughly 20,000 tomato farmers. So we talk really big scale. Uh, we also talk uh, a slightly different type of uh, farmers, uh, so fairly large scale farmers, which are capital uh, which have capital, at least in, in uh, Maharashtra. If we talk about uh, Karnataka, it's a different story, of course. Uh, smaller farms. Uh, I think there are a lot of possibilities to look at this, uh, um, uh, let's say, technologies, but we also have to be very clear that the technology will work for certain farmers and will not work for other farmers. And for some of the farmers, this technology will be too small, and for other farmers, it will be too expensive. And so uh, we need to really look at for whom this uh, technology is actually uh, applicable and, and how it can be used. Um, we also need to look at some technical issues. Huh? So the technical issues of the, the, the sprayers, is, uh, they are nice, they are used by farmers, but what we have also seen is that, let's say, the coverage of the crop by this type of, of uh, sprayers is not always good enough. Huh? The power mm -hmm. of, of uh, the machine is not, not, not so good at times. 
we also have to look at uh, let's say the 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 the, the archonics. Uh, I could not actually see it proper, but I it is very important that we also look at the light. It's a technical issue. Uh, so do we have enough light in the nurseries uh, for the different uh, levels? Correct. Correct. Amans, can you please quickly give brief about AFC, uh, the project being implemented? Ah, uh, well, you, you want to know Thank the. You. I'm already going the technical things. I'm usually not so looking at promoting our organization. So uh, anyway, so AFC is a, is is a, uh, let's say a consulting firm from uh, Bonn, Germany. Uh, they are implementing on behalf of GIZ uh, the the. Yeah, the tomato and the potato value chain program in uh, under the Green Innovation Center in Maharashtra and Karnataka. Uh, so we work in many different countries, and AFC has uh, contracted uh, ETC India Private Limited to do the field work in uh, India uh, because we don't have uh, a, a representation in India. Uh, so they have asked us to do that. So we have a collaboration, AFC, ETC, and we have about uh, 60 people working in on the potato value chain and tomato value chain together. Uh, we have four offices uh, in the field and one major office in uh, Bangalore. And the major office is five people. Uh, so the staff is in the field. They are not in the headquarters. Um, that is uh, the philosophy we are having. We are not pro. Uh, the AFC is a for profit company. ETC is a not for profit company. So that is uh, the background. Yeah. Thank That's you, Mans. Thank you, thank you, Mans. Uh, that's okay. uh, small and sweet. Uh, now we move on to uh, CS Reddy uh, from AP Mass. Uh, welcome, Reddy, sir. Uh, you need to unmute, uh, Reddy, sir, please. Yeah, good morning to everybody. Um, yes, I'm uh, delighted to be part of this uh, webinar, which talks about uh, sustainable energy and I'm glad that Selco is able to coordinate this. Um, so just to give a quick uh, two minute brief about the organization, uh, AP Mass uh, is uh, celebrating its 20th anniversary. Uh, so that means we have been involved in India with the uh, development programming for 20 years nearly. Uh, so we work primarily on institution development uh, self-help groups, federations of self-help groups of the women. Um, so that's why we are called Mahila Abhivruddhi Society, Women's Development Society. Uh, there are uh, 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 10 million uh, self-help groups uh, in the country and uh, they manage uh, financial services. Uh, in addition to working with uh, developing self-help groups and their federations as sustainable institutions, uh, we also work with former producer organizations. Uh, as of now, we have promoted directly 39 FPOs across the country, predominantly on the Pradesh and Telangana. Uh, we also are the resource support agency for NABARD uh, in mentoring and incubating former producer organizations. So together we work with 194 former producer organizations across Telangana and Andhra Pradesh. Uh, again, our, as an organization, our focus is how do we develop these into uh, sustainable business organizations and to us as an organization, uh, energy efficient solutions, renewable energy is very, very uh, important. Uh, in fact, I just want to mention we implement a number of projects across the country and one interesting project to just mention is uh, the Climate Smart Villages uh, project that we are implementing, funded by the AEAN Luxembourg. So I'll talk a little bit later about it. Uh, 
uh, but I'm uh, delighted and uh, happy to be part of this. And I was uh, very happy to listen to those uh, uh, innovations that were shared before this session. Thank you, Shashi. Thank you, CS, and congratulations. You were also one of the implementing partner into that. Yes. Uh, well, uh, now we move on to uh, Partha Sardi from Wiltham Welfare. Partha, Partha, welcome on board. Thanks, uh, Shashi, yeah. and it's really a pleasure to uh, uh, talk to uh, everyone and then this uh, being part of this uh, one discussion. So, Welting Railway actually uh, is a German organization which is working mainly on food and nutrition security and uh, on vocational education in the agriculture allied sector and on agroecology. Related issues, and as part of the Green Innovation Center, we have been working with uh, the Green College uh, program, wherein we have uh, established eleven uh, green colleges across five states. Out of these, uh, in uh, three states, we are working on the sustainability phase of these uh, green colleges, and in two uh, states, it is in Karnataka and uh, Maharashtra, we are working with uh, uh, the green colleges in partnership with uh, Myrda and uh, IARD. Uh, so, uh, we have worked with over 40,000 uh, ecopreneurs, uh, eco uh, rural youth, uh, and uh, with uh, around 200 high potential rural entrepreneurs, we will come to that and about uh, 25 FPOs or so. And we have also formed a social enterprise called Skill Green, uh, which uh, sort of incubates these uh, green colleges and uh, in addition to that offers uh, these uh, services related to uh, these skill building uh, institutions to make them effective and uh, uh, to uh, bring in that uh, professionalism in their uh, services. So uh, this is a brief overview of uh, uh, the uh, Green College program and to Welcome Real Faith. So the main uh, vision of uh, the Green Colleges uh, is uh, to make uh, agriculture as an occupation of choice for the uh, rural youth and uh, we do this through an uh, approach which can be uh, summed up as uh, you know, an acronym uh, called C S E E, which is focusing on skill development, entrepreneurship development, and the ecosystem uh, development. So I think this uh, briefly sums up uh, what the uh, Green Colleges uh, do and what uh, we are doing as part of the Green Innovation Center. Over to you, Sashi. Thank you, uh, Partha, for being on time and uh, good to know that uh, C is emerging from the Skill Green Colleges. Uh, now we move on to uh, Rachita uh, from Selco Foundation. Uh, welcome on board, Rachita. Thank you, Sashi. And uh, very good morning to everyone. Thank you so much for joining, even though I know it's a, it's a holiday for a lot of us today. Um, so we at Selco Foundation, we were founding, founded in 2010. Um, and we're an NGO which is based out of Bangalore, but we have work across the country. Um, we realize as an organization that, I, that sustainable energy has a very, very critical role to play in augmenting all of our work that we're doing towards achieving our developmental goals. Now, whether it's health, whether it's livelihood, whether it's general well-being itself. So today we have been discussing a lot more around our livelihood goals. So it is specifically discussing the role of energy in with farmers specifically and in agriculture specifically. And in that also we have been looking at creating innovations um, for more small and marginal, more vulnerable farmers um, that are in the country. We realized that sustainable energy, there are two kinds of opportunities that exist. And we saw some of the examples earlier with the three case studies that were presented also. One is in actually improving efficiency of the existing operations that might be there. Um, the financial you know, inefficiencies that may, might be there, operational inefficiencies that might be there, which can be actually improved with the addition of sustainable energy in the interventions itself. The second aspect that we see where the opportunity lies if we start looking at sustainable energy in agriculture is that it actually improves the ownership and value add at the last mile. So it actually can help decentralize a lot of the, you know, the incomes, the value add incomes that can be created if there are, you know, good innovations that are that are being done, keeping the end user in mind. Um, now, this kind of, um, you know, I wanted to clarify that when we mean innovations here, this means that it's not just technology. There are places where we would need technical innovations, but there are a lot of business model, financial models, supply chain models, ownership models that also require innovations. And for that, we work very, very closely with partners whose core is livelihood. So we had Gotham Sir from Harsha Trust. We have 
CS Reddy sir from AP Mars. We have Mans from AF AFC. All of these core partners who are looking at you know the core livelihood interventions. We partner with them to really bring in where sustainable energy has a critical role in either in improving the efficiency or increasing the last mile uh, value add. So um, with that, I think handing over back to Sashi. Thank you. Thank you, Rachita. Uh, well, that was a great, uh, powerful communication. That is, uh, innovation is not a technology, and we should also look beyond technology. We should look for the models. Great. Uh, this uh, takes us to the next question. Uh, thank you for giving the brief about uh, respective organizations. Uh, but uh, how do you foresee uh, the potential for renewable energy into your existing operations? Uh, for example, uh, CS mentioned that uh, CS is having a 20 years on ground field level experiences where he's working for women empowerment. That's a great to know. Uh, how do you see that renewable energy component could be connected to it and where do you see the fit? Uh, CS, may I, can I start with you, please? Yeah, thank you, Shashi. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, um, uh, you know, uh, we work with around uh, uh, 15,000 farmers, specifically uh, in partnership with GIZ under the Green Innovation Center project uh, in Madanapalli area of uh, Chitur district, Andhra Pradesh, near Bangalore. Um, you know, the other project that I mentioned, uh, the Climate Smart Villages, basically we are focusing on smart energy, smart institutions, um, you know, smart agriculture. So how they can adapt to the changing um, uh, environment or climate. Uh, so that's kind of our focus. Just a small example is like there is cook stoves that are being uh, promoted. Uh, silt application uh, is also widespread in the, uh, uh, through the farmer producer organizations uh, that we are focusing on. Uh, water conservation through watershed programs and uh, working with NRGS. Again, that's another area of our focus. Uh, specifically under the Green Innovation Center, I think it was already mentioned that hydrophonics is something that has just been initiated. Solar dryers, I think, is something that we are beginning to have. Again, for entrepreneurs, uh, may, mostly women who will be drawn from the uh, project, uh, those who are shareholders in the farmer producer organizations. We want to look at the FPO as the agency that takes responsibility and be accountable for promoting sustainable energy solutions. Because once APMAS withdraws from this project, uh, the farmer producer organization should be able to take this forward. One interesting innovation we have done is uh, promoted a federation of the farmer producer organizations. So there are now uh, eight FPOs around Madanapalli area of Chitur district, which are formed into a federation. So it's uh, called the uh, Madanapalli Tomato uh, Farmer Producer Company with uh, now 8,000 members. So there we are uh, looking at uh, crop residue management. We are looking at uh, waste management at the mandis, particularly where the tomatoes are marketed. Uh, we are looking at uh, decentralized uh, grading and sorting through the, uh, you know, the primary processing centers that are being set up under the project. Uh, we are looking at solar dryers. Uh, so I think, uh, as was mentioned in the initial presentation, our idea is to pilot and see the success and then look at the scaling up. And we are seriously working with the horticulture department, government of Andhra Pradesh, uh, so that these all these innovations can be scaled up and mainstreamed uh, because there is deep interest from the horticulture university, from the research centers, and from the Department of Horticulture to take these initiatives forward. So we are, uh, in a way, excited about uh, working with the Selco Foundation and uh, the support of GIZ uh, in making these uh, innovations uh, show uh, positive results and then uh, solar, uh, you know, uh, uh, solar pump sets also is something that we thought of, but the groundwater being low, we could not think about it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, CS, uh, for the uh, to the point uh, uh, discussion. And uh, the interesting part was uh, the FPO, Federation of the FPOs that you have, eight FPO. That was quite interesting to note. Uh, 
Uh, sh now, should we move on to Partha Sarvi on the uh, Skill Green initiative? How do you see uh, the skill, uh, the linkage between Skill Green and also the renewable energy? Uh, thanks, uh, Sashi. And uh, so, uh, in the renewable energy uh, space, uh, when we look at uh, the green colleges, so one of our uh, green college partners, uh, Ramkrishna Mission, has implemented the off-the-grid uh, so solar uh, uh, energy solutions in uh, Sundarban's area of uh, West Bengal. So these areas actually don't have, are still out of the electricity uh, grid. And so apart from offering these uh, solutions, uh, we've also worked uh, with uh, the entrepreneurs who can offer these services to these uh, households in uh, solar maintenance and all that, which is a very uh, popular uh, course uh, in that uh, area. The other thing is also we have worked on this uh, uh, solar solutions through a women entrepreneurship model where we work with uh, a collaboration with the microfinance uh, agencies and uh, it is more of a uh, women entrepreneurship uh, model. So now looking at the scope within the uh, work of the uh, green colleges, so we work with a lot of uh, rural entrepreneurs uh, who are uh, I mean, for whom uh, in their enterprises, actually energy is a key uh, factor of uh, production. So some of the examples are like uh, these uh, nurseries that we are uh, working with and uh, these uh, vegetable growers for whom uh, this irrigation and, uh, uh, you know, using these uh, solar pumps, we see a lot of. Now, poultry hatcheries where, uh, you know, uh, continuous uh, electricity and, uh, you know, where uh, elect uh, erratic electricity is actually a problem. So, uh, there we see uh, potential for using these uh, solutions. We have some entrepreneurs like uh, these leaf plate makers who are actually doing a very profitable uh, business today. But uh, where uh, this, uh, because of power cuts and also, uh, you know, because the cost of uh, electricity is a factor. So, uh, introducing these uh, solar solutions can actually help them in uh, uh, developing the profitability in their uh, business. So we see ample scope and in fact uh, when we talk of green colleges, the green in our uh, green colleges is actually agriculture light sector and the renewable energy sector. So we have a vision of uh, working on this uh, renewable energy sector and we see ample scope for uh, working on this. Uh, well, thank you Partha. Although government is claiming that 100% of electrification has been done at village level, still a long way to give, go, right? Uh, thanks for highlighting that. Uh, now we move on to uh, Mans. Uh, you have been uh, mentioning in your brief that uh, you have a field based uh, office where you work on tomato and potato value chain. How do you see the potential of uh, renewable energy into this ecosystem? Although you initially started brief, sorry I interrupted, but maybe now you can continue. Thank you, Mans. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I'm uh, too much on the technical issues. Um, yeah, so if we look at the value chain uh, of the tomato, so to, to so looking at the nursery part, uh, the, the vertical uh, type of hydroponics is an interesting idea. Uh, but it's mostly important in places where space is uh, not uh, so much available. Uh, so in Karnataka and Kadur, it could be a, a solution for some of the, the nursery owners. Um, we have to look at, uh, let's say, the, the potential of, uh, uh, let's say, the uh, total production. Uh, is that is that uh, is that going okay? And do we have uh, the financial resources, uh, or do the farmers have the financial resources? Uh, it's an interesting idea that I would like to test out on a small scale. Um, uh, so we, I'm not yet thinking about uh, scaling it up. Uh, there are certain technical improvements that we could look at, uh, maybe uh, adding some more uh, LED, uh, so we uh, so that we can increase the light intensity on the different levels of the the um, scales. Uh, so then another issue that we have to look at is in that I can't see if water is dripping from one to the other level, but because that can transfer diseases. Um, so we need to look at a few things there still and developing and see how things are working. I am, uh, let's say, looking at the, the, the sprayers. I think that is a, a good idea. Some farmers are using that already. Uh, 
we have to look at the power issue, we have to look at uh, the distribution of the pesticides over the field. Uh, is that really okay? Your farmers are still using a shower. Uh, if we look at uh, the, the nursery or the, the video, they are using a shower, not a nozzle. Uh, so that is a big problem. Uh, so the, too much of pesticide and water is going to be applied to the crop, and that is not what we should have. So we need to look at the technical issues also there and see, okay, how can we get a proper distribution of the, the pesticide. Now, if we look at uh, the, the uh, electricity and solar energy for, um, let's say, uh, creating uh, pumps and so on, we have to look at to what extent can we feed that back into the grid. Now, because it is uh, an expensive thing, and we need to see how can we earn it back. So I think we need to look at also can we connect to the grid. That is a big issue in both um, uh, Maharashtra and Karnataka. Uh, we have to see uh, to what extent that policies can be changed. Um, I'm very much interested in cold storage for uh, the, the seed potatoes. We are working on that already a little bit. Uh, it still we have to see the, the, the financial uh, financials of it. Is it going to earn money? What is the ownership? What is the, uh, let's say, organization that we put around it? Is it owned by the farmer? Is it owned by the FPC? Are we renting it out? Against what cost? So there are a lot of issues there. Um, so I think we are entering into a research period where we are testing a lot of things and see what is the, what of these things are useful to farmers. And we can add and we can subtract and we can uh, change. And uh, so I see it more as uh, entering into a joint collaboration to find out what is possible for farmers, what is useful, useful and how should we uh, organize that both in terms of ownership and in terms of financing. That is my short uh, comment, or maybe too long, it's also possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mans. Uh, probably you have uh, highlighted the very uh, crucial point. Uh, you are asking about affordability of the small farmers when we talk about small farmers and accessibility of the technology and also customization of the technology and scalability. Very well taken, uh, noted, uh, Mans. Uh, now, uh, moving on to Rachita Mishra. Uh, Rachita, basically, I should not uh, check with you on the renewable energy you know, correlation because you are the one who are the sub service provider. Maybe from other end, what I can uh, see is that how do you see your technologies most fit for tomato and potato value chain of GIZ intervention? Sure, Sashi. So, um... In the chat as well, as and as my colleague Hoda had also pointed out in the beginning, that this this program that we'll be taking forward is a lead up from the uh, the research that was done very hands on with AP Mass and AFC to really identify where the critical points lied in the tomato and uh, potato value chain. Um, now, from that itself, I mean, um, as I said earlier, also what we what we wanted to do was keep the farmer at the center. So if you keep the farmer at the center itself, like what, how do you really look at increasing the value for him? Um, now, when we look at livelihood in general, and as uh, I think it was pointed out earlier by some of the panelists as well, like um, when it comes to livelihood, energy reliability, the quality of energy that you're getting becomes extremely important. So when is energy available? How much power backup is there? What are the fluctu voltage fluctuations are there? Those things become really, really critical in saying, will the farmer actually adopt these technologies? And will he or she be able to see the value from it as well? Will they be able to convert the technology into actual income increase? Now, if you see the whole value chain, the, the points where actually energy plays a role in making it inefficient are many. So if you keep again the farmer at the center, there are input costs which go high because energy is not there. And that's where things like nursery comes in. That's where things like sprayers come in. You know, if the nursery is not being productive, one whole summer season is going without, you know, it actually looking at saplings. It's, it has only one season in, in a year that it's following. It will affect the supplies for the farmers as well. 
same thing with the sprays also same thing as mans also mentioned with the seed potatoes if we don't have seed potatoes cold storage available at a decentralized level transportation of it procurement of it makes the farmers kind of um, not so resilient the other aspect which we see a big potential is in actually processing of the produce itself so you have the harvest that has happened you have tomatoes potatoes available can we actually look at utilizing these fpos that are there the federations that have already been created to create processing units also can we actually look at the green operations you know the horticulture department food processing departments you know actually look at uh, using those funds to create that infrastructure which will look at processing now of course it depends on you know what is the the scale at which we are looking at as i think mans also pointed out earlier like you know the scale needs to be questioned um when it comes to scale technology will be questioned the potato chips making unit that we we saw in the case study maybe is not applicable in certain areas because the fpo produce is quite higher so technology would need to be looked at as well similarly financial models will will need to be looked at as well the crop itself in tomato we know like the type of tomato that you grow will it be used for juicing will it be used for puree which will it be used for you know a sun dried tomatoes will it be used for ketchup it differs quite a bit so there are you know many such options available but i think it was important for us to say what exactly is it that exists on the ground what is the capacity of farmers that exists on the ground because each technology that we implement will have to be supported by the whole ecosystem of skilling market linkage um you know capacity building financing um which is which is something that we will be developing together with the partners that are on this panel as well so as man said i agree we have to look at a spectrum of solutions that will be applicable depending on on what the farmer's capacity is and what the value chain capacity is and it is definitely going to be um a more field based research more implementation based research to actually see what is the impact of the interventions that we're bringing in how does the cash flow change accordingly and because of that what kind of financial models can we actually propose thank you rachita Uh, i think uh, this uh, takes us to the uh, next debate like kind of you know the market before you intervene into the uh, space uh, well uh, the uh, next area of uh, question would be like more like uh, with the existing scenario like we have been not we it's uh, completely the entire country has been affected or maybe the world has been affected with the covid situation so uh, what is the uh, resilient factor we see within our farming fraternity Uh, maybe i should start with uh, rachita on this like how uh, the renewable energy integration would really you know create resilient factor into the covid kind of a situation among the uh, stakeholders especially the farming fraternity thanks sashi so so yeah i mean definitely i think we've been reading from the very uh, beginning the the i think the time that at which the pandemic came in to india and uh, the lockdowns happened was a very critical time for the um the agriculture sector as well um which and and we, i think we all have been reading about the kind of impact that we saw um on the farming community but when it comes to a renewable energy and from the very beginning you know um amongst these partners that we have on the panel as well we were we have been discussing is is uh, what do we really mean by resilience and i think like so far we've been talking about you know re- let's decentralize the value but what does decentralization of value exactly mean um i think the focus that you know you would see in the discussions that we are having whether it was the case studies that were being presented or you know the work that ap mass wealth hunger and afc are talking about is really about creating ownership at the ground level uh, so it's not really about decentralization of a machine or a technology but it's really the full ownership of the enterprise the full ownership of the agricultural value chain being at the being at the last mile level um we saw during the covid uh, in many scenarios where where fpos who had the capacity who were in control of their value chain who were in control of the market linkages as well were able to respond faster uh, they did actually look at you know creating linkages with local grocery stores you know local pds distribution systems local dcs uh, to actually look at not just uh, making sure that their produce was able to be Uh, sold but new market linkages were also created you know identifying 
who is buying food right now who will be my market right now and let's get the produce out in that manner um so we really felt feel that you know there is this whole aspect of when you look at renewable energy in combination with the right ownership model which is at a decentralized level you are able to create resilience because you are in control of the decisions that you are making so that would be you know one opportunity that i feel we would be really really interested to see how do we look at it in the tomato and potato value chain uh, which is why in my previous uh, comment as well would would really want to look at how do we really shorten the supply chains whether it's the input costs or even the market linkages how do we really do that thank you rachita i think uh, this is quite a resilient creation kind of a thing it's a, what we see from a different angle uh, let's uh, see the uh, uh, perspective from the uh, practitioner mans uh, should i request you to uh, share your views like how do you see renewable energy integration into our existing value chain is an uh, kind of a uh, increasing or decreasing the resilient factors into our uh, with, within our farmers um yeah now one of the things that i can say is that locally electricity has no covid restrictions it can travel yeah, so that is uh, that is for sure yeah so to have make a direct connection between renewables and covid that is a, a story that we that's a nice story but that is not the issue and so uh, as i think what nikita also said okay the most important thing is that we look at decentralized uh, systems so, so uh, the production systems that are decentralized and we look at decentralized marketing um so that is uh, that are the most important things to look at and there can be in certain cases there can be uh, renewable energy insight Uh, but we really have to be very careful that we don't uh, say, okay, now that also has to be totally, uh, let's say, localized. Uh, that is possible, but then we also have to look at can we feed it back into the grid, and do we have uh, positions where we can actually do it? Huh? So. Um, the farmers are usually not close to one of those uh, spots where you can easily feed it back into the into the grid and the legal aspects also of it are also difficult and so uh, that is something we need to look into uh, and if you can have let's say village based uh, systems uh, which are a full village we are making sustainable uh, through uh, solar panels and so on and we have a local grid that is totally uh, separated from the national grid that is something we could look into uh, but uh, but that is what we really need to think about uh, so where where does this renewable energy actually fit in yeah thank you mans uh, i think uh, the perspective you are coming from is that doubling the farmers income if there is a opportunity for feeding back to the grid definitely the farmer is the most benefited out of the technologies uh now uh, may i request uh, partha sardi to give uh, the perspectives like uh, do you see the integration of renewable energy into your component especially uh, skill green colleges do you see uh, it creates a resilient factors or do you see kind of a uh, decreases the resilient factor among, among your beneficiaries thanks ashish i think there are two uh, aspects to uh, resilience Uh, which i would like to highlight here i think in the uh, uh, post covid uh, scenario agriculture based enterprises themselves have become very prominent and uh, you know lot of the enterprises like for take the example of poultry so uh, after uh, covid the uh, uh, poultry lot of the entrepreneurs actually suffered losses because of a uh, lot of things that happened around uh, poultry and now it is a recovery uh, phase you know so now uh, in our green college we seeing these hatcheries uh, and likewise in uh, vegetable farming these nurseries they are actually working overtime to be able to enable these uh, enterprises to recover 
so uh, i think there is uh, a lot of uh, scope for making these enterprises more effective and to make it uh, you know more uh, profitable that is one area where i think renewable energy can uh, play a role uh, because in the overall context that i think agriculture based enterprises have become more uh, prominent in this uh, scenario second thing is uh, we see there is a scope a lot of innovation uh, because i think there is uh, like also uh, it was being mentioned earlier uh, that uh, the farmers and uh, have realized the importance of these farmer producer organizations and how it can play a, a role in the uh, continuity of the supply chains and uh, you know there uh, there is a need for uh, innovations like uh, for example for uh, value addition for increasing the shelf life of uh, the uh, commodities so i think uh, innovation plays a, a key role because there is a lot of appetite now for these innovations and uh, interest in these uh, collective enterprises has really uh, grown so in that sense i think uh, to make use of this uh, opportunity is uh, i mean there is a plenty of uh, scope for renewable energy uh, solutions to be uh, introduced at this uh, point in time so that's how i view uh, the relevance of uh, these renewable energy solutions in this uh, present context Great. Uh, thank you, Partha, for giving you a perspective. Innovations and renewable energy should go together. Uh, now we move on to uh, CS. Uh, CS, you have a huge base of uh, self-help uh, movement as well as you are also working with eight, eight FPOs with our uh, Green Innovation Center program and specifically focusing on tomato value chain. How do you see integrating uh, this would uh, renewable energy would be a, uh, increasing the resilient factor or would be decreasing in a COVID kind of a situation? No, it's a very uh, factor. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, uh, moving on to uh, renewable energy is the way to go. Uh, so I think we should uh, uh, strongly engage with the farmer producer organizations and their shareholders. Uh, and it definitely uh, helps them to become autonomous. So to that extent, uh, maybe shocks can be more easily withstood by the farmers organizations and their enterprises. But just two cautions I want to mention here, based on our own experience, is that uh, you know uh, we should not look at anything as a magic bullet. Uh, so that's I think is very important uh, when we go and discuss this with the farmers. Uh, and farmers should be able to embrace this and feel uh, excited about. In the chat room, there was a mention about cost, for example. Uh, the battery operated sprayers are you know much cheaper compared to the solar or rechargeable uh, sprayers so i think uh, cost factors second uh, i think please understand that agriculture power is free in many states definitely is free in andhra pradesh so when you are talking about free energy versus solar energy which involves some cost so how does it become uh, you know uh, viable for the farmers and their organizations to take up uh, unless, of course, there are huge amount of subsidies that may come from the state government or from the projects. Uh, the other factor that I want to also mention is uh, uh, how do we demonstrate this? And then farmers are able to see the cost effectiveness uh, and uh, are able to then uh, scale it up. For example, our farmer development centers run by the FPOs. These are input shops. Uh, where you know uh, these uh, equipment, solar-based uh, equipment can be uh, sold uh, in AP mass. In uh, two of our FDC, FDCs, we put these solar lights, uh, and uh, the farmers did not uh, buy them uh, simply because uh, they have uh, these cell phones that have a light. So uh, you know, so I think we have to really um, see how the farmers would respond and how the farmer producer organizations will take this responsibility. So it may be useful to have a subcommittee of uh, the FPO Federation uh, to uh, you know, take up this whole idea of uh, uh, you know, uh, sustainable energy and what might be the solutions. I also felt uh, there are a number of solar uh, energy related initiatives that the state governments have already put in place. So we may also want to study them, understand what are the strengths and weaknesses of those uh, so that whenever we are advising or providing information to the farmers, uh, there is a clarity on 
what we are proposing and how in the long term uh, they will become uh, efficient uh, for the farmers. Because farmers, if they find it beneficial, they will embrace it. Uh, so it is uh, our responsibility under the Green Innovation Center uh, to show and to demonstrate that these so solutions are cost effective and can be, uh, you know, for example, maintenance might be an issue sometimes when you have solar systems. So these are some of the factors that we may need to take into consideration. But uh, resilience will uh, surely improve uh, because uh, it can help them to deal with the shocks. Thank you. Uh, very nice message, uh, CS. Actually, uh, renewable energy is not a solution. Uh, it's not a magic wand that can uh, really change everything. It's kind of a mean to reach our goals. So uh, thank you for that uh, valued uh, information. Uh, now uh, this brings us to uh, question and answer session. Uh, we have uh, two questions as of now. Uh, please uh, participants, if you have uh, more questions, uh, do text and uh, let us know. Uh, Mans, uh, the question is for you. Uh, can you give us some examples? from other parts of the world that have worked well for similar types of farmers, especially during and post COVID, with a focus on efficiency and decentralization? Well, you really uh, ambushed me with this question. <laughs> I have not prepared for that. Uh, so, uh, so uh, let me, let me no, simplify the question. Is, Thing. So I, I think there are no, uh, let's say, to my knowledge, uh, at least I don't have examples of that. Uh, so in other parts of the country, uh, but what we we can see uh, in uh, in India, what we have seen, okay, with uh, the uh, problems that we are facing with, uh, let's say, the potato supply from, for instance, Punjab. Uh, that is that is a major issue. Uh, so uh, so there we need to go for this uh, localized uh, production of the seed potatoes. That is just to make sure that we don't have that disruption again. Um, so, but we see in in India a lot of these uh, kind of things happening. Uh, so import of the important uh, parts of of uh, let's say the automatic planter and so on is a problem. Uh, so we need to uh, also look at now how much uh, India itself can scale up certain items that they are now importing from uh, from the rest of the world. Uh, so uh, a better quality steel and so on is a, is a very important thing for India to work on. Um, so we don't speak only on, uh, let's say, the scale of the farmers, but we also talk of, of a country. And the country also needs to to be self uh, sufficient in certain important issues. And so um, that is what I feel that there are certain parts of of Indian policy that we could look at and uh, to make it more sustainable for India itself and more distributed. But that is uh, so. I can't give you examples from the rest of the world. Sorry if I had. Uh, known this question earlier, I would have uh, investigated that, but I don't know. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mans. Uh, the advantage of virtual meeting is that nobody can protest you, no con contractly converse you. So anyway, uh, uh, com this uh, brings us to maybe we have a few more questions. Uh, um, what we can do is that uh, we will email you personally uh, and uh, seek uh, the clarity on maybe response uh, that we can work it out uh, and uh, share it uh, to all that assurance I can give. Maybe to conclude, uh, uh, based on our uh, panel discussion, uh, so we definitely see uh, a innovation more like a not like only to technology. It should go beyond technology. It should be finance. It should be ownership, and it should also be models, especially like partnership models. And uh, we need to uh, uh, the second point to highlight is that need to contextualize the uh, interventions wherever we want to intervene. And uh, we need to uh, set the benchmarks uh, that should be uh, very high transforming farmers' incomes. 
number four is that more learning should be shared on not just success basis, uh, but uh, failures will also be counted into the analysis on why the program have failed and why we uh, could not able to uh, work on it. And so that it, it gives a good learning experience for us to come back on it and uh, uh, work better, at least to inform people who are seriously working into this sector. Number five is that uh, the uh, our project especially has a global relevance where we can learn and transfer learning to other similar contexts around the world. Uh, so it's a great opportunity and we would be taking it up uh, soon and uh, would like to uh, welcome Selco on board and uh, wishing you uh, all the best and would also like to thank all the panelists, especially Mans uh, and Gerrit. It's uh, kind of a, too early for you. Sorry to trouble you in the early morning. And uh, thank you, CS, uh, and uh, thank you, Partha Sardi, and thank you, Rachita Amshra. Thank you so much. So with this, we close this uh, uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Sashi. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.